Have you ever wondered, how do the rich get rich? We are going to load you up today. Brian, I am so excited about this because today we're going to walk through the five paths to wealth and how you can actually stack them up, tips and tricks to uh, maximize, and then some traps to avoid to make sure that you don't go the wrong way, to make sure that you don't get distracted. But before we do that, if this is your first time checking us out, first time hanging out with us, we want you to subscribe. So right now, just below the box, subscribe so you can stay up to date with all the information we're putting out there, like how rich people are getting rich. Now, remember, these are stackable, so but you got to find your point of entry. Every person who builds wealth has to have the way that actually built the foundation that did become what was the thing that got them into the category of wealthy, and then they started stacking other things. So these things are stackable, but what we're going to try to do is stratify what percentage out of 100, if you were trying to figure out how did people become wealthy, This is going to be your ditty. All right, so let's go to the first one, Brian. Now, you and I both, we come from very similar backgrounds, and this is something that I was taught at an early age. This is something that I learned very on, that the way that wealthy people become wealthy, unfortunately, is you have to be born into it. You have to be someone who wealth is something that's passed down from generation to generation. So if you want to be on that side of the equation... Your parents need us to have been on that side of the equation. Yeah, this is something I, I think I've shared the first 22 years of my life, because that's how, how long it took before I graduated from the University of Georgia, then took my first job in public accounting. Mm-hmm. But that's what I thought. I thought, you know, really the the, the quickest pass the wealth, the, the way the majority did it was that they got that silver, lucky mm-hmm. silver spoon club. But that's not actually what the data shows. And, and by the way, We are going to, like I said, interlace throughout this our own wealth survey of our clients, but we're not the only ones that have come up with this data. You've heard us share, if you were throwing horseshoes on wealth creation, there's a stat that we use consistently, and it is 80% of millionaires are first generation. Look at this research. Yeah, it's pretty wild. If you look at all these different sources, dating back to 1892 when they used to determine, okay, how many folks... Inherited wealth, 84% were first generation. And then you fast forward to 1996, the number was 80%. And then you fast forward to a study done in 2019, it was 79%. And then even studies done in 2022 found that 76% are self-made or first generation. So this idea that wealth is something that's passed on, that's permeated, is not backed up by this because most folks who have millionaire status didn't get it because they inherited money from their parents or from relatives. But this stat couldn't exist without some bad stuff going on, too. And this is a stat that makes me so sad. And this is something that will be a teachable moment here. But wealth is not easily kept. Just like there's getting wealthy behaviors, there's also staying wealthy behaviors. And why do you need to know staying wealthy is because look at this stat. 70% of wealth is lost by the second generation, Mm -hmm. meaning your kids, if you are the first one that's crossing into that seven-figure status, your kids, 70% of them are going to blow through and it's going to be gone in their lifetime. By the grandkids, 90% of the wealth is gone. This is something to be very mindful and of. I don't even know if we shared this, but what, one of the things we do is we do an annual wealth survey where we survey all of our clients and ask them some interesting questions. And we asked, okay, how many of you, of you clients that work with us here to Bound Wealth, received an inheritance of greater than $100,000? Because we didn't want people who maybe they received $10,000 or $20,000 who you received a small enough sum that it was not a material part of you becoming wealthy. And the number was only 9%. Yeah. So it was not a majority of the clients, not a majority of the folks with whom we work. So this must not be the key. But if you are someone who you see these stats and you're thinking, man, this is troubling. This is problematic. That's okay. We have some tips for you on how to money guy maximize if you are someone who either has wealth or you're someone who's born into wealth. Yeah, so let's let's kind of tackle these. And act, so you don't, because I know a lot of you are financial mutants, you're building wealth, but you want to kind of make sure, and this is something I've even had conversations with my oldest daughter on, is that when I'm explaining to her opportunities, wealth building, other things, I said, you know, look, in the long term, I want you to know that coming into wealth, or at least having parents who've made good financial decisions, 
It is going to have the responsibility that if you know, I don't want you to be part of that seventy percent. Mm-hmm. I want you to be part of that successful thirty percent. Right. So I want to give you guys out there in the audience the tips so you can talk to your children, your grandchildren, so you don't repeat that awful stat that you hopefully have the exception, which is building wealth upon wealth so you can truly think in an abundance mindset. And we think that the earlier you can start, the better. Early discussions with young children about give, save, spend can be huge. I mean, my daughter, she just lost another tooth uh, a week ago and some money showed up, right? That's the way we do things at our house. Some money showed up and I was like, all right, hey, babe, because you know, she's seven years old now. I was like, all right, what are you going to do? She's like, well, daddy, I got to do give, save, spend. And I was like, yes, you get it. You understand when money comes into your possession, there's a right and a wrong thing to do with it. And so she did that. And now we're going to go figure out what we're going to spend the money on. So if you can start those conversations early, those little habits you can teach them will stack through time to when they get to your children's age where you can do more advanced techniques. Yeah, I love one of my favorite. You guys have seen me share this on social media. I love parental matching. Mm -hmm. We have a dollar for dollar match policy in my household. So it started off early with babysitting and other things is that when my daughter would babysit, people would pay me and my wife through Venmo. And I remember we would say, hey, Aves, we owe you some money. How do you want it? She'd be like, hey, um, how about instead of giving me that hundred dollars, one hundred twenty dollars? Why don't we go ahead and put it into the I Roth IRA um, that y'all set up? And that would make me so so happy mm-hmm. that she was actually showing the behavior that I have I, I've, I've shared with you guys. She is in college now, but she's already in the five figures of her Roth IRA, and <laughs> that insane. all comes from because when she started working at Chick Fil A and fast food, she's continued the behavior of saving and investing. And my whole thing was to prime the pump. Mm -hmm. We all know how exciting it is to watch your money grow and replace what you can do with your hands, your back, and and your brain, and and actually replace weeks and, and eventually months and years worth of what you can do. But it's great for kids to see that, for your children, so that they actually get skin in the game, they actually start investing, and let that money work as hard as they can. But then there's another side to that equation also, because as our kids get older and as they start to recognize, okay, maybe mom and dad have done some things that have put us in a different place in life, right? Maybe that you know we're not the, the average household. One of the things I think is so important is teaching our kids about scarcity and generosity. The fact that, hey, just because things might be comfortable because of some decisions mom and dad made, it doesn't mean that everything is comfortable. We have to make opportunity cost decisions. So if we want to take a trip, there's something that we can't do. If a toy breaks, it doesn't mean we can replace it. And we need to be recognized that the things that we have can be used to help other folks. We can pour out into other people. If you can establish that in your kids before they fly out of the nest, I think you're going to set them up on solid financial footing to, again, break the wealth cycle that exists in this country. Well, I would draw attention to create scarcity environments in your child's life. I mean, there's a reason. I mean, I grew up, I, I, I live in a neighborhood where I still cringe when a lot of my my, my peers, and they'll, they'll watch this content, but when my peers are buying their 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds, brand new cars, nice cars, I cringe because I think that that there's a lot of learning opportunities by letting your child drive. Like my daughter, I made her pay half. Mm -hmm. So all she could afford when she bought half of her first car was a 15-year-old car. So, I mean, that car, I think that scarcity, not getting everything, will hopefully fight the entitlement. It will fight the understanding the value of a dollar. You do need to create these environments. Now, look, I love taking trips with my family because I believe in blossoming memories, but the stuff, I'm going to try to create some scarcity so that the, the my daughter gets wins personally, so she actually wants to keep stacking success for herself and has enjoyment from that versus if you start them off at the tippity top of the hill with no scarcity, you can imagine when you get to real life on your own, it can feel like mm-hmm. a letdown. Do not set your kids up. And that leads to the fact that You might need to understand that windfalls and giving money to your children might feel good to you, but you might actually be creating a situation of economic outpatient care, that your kids cannot make it without you. They have dependency on you. That is not a recipe for success. And maybe you're someone out there who maybe your parents have done well, and you recognize that perhaps there's going to be an inheritance to come your way recognize that windfalls aren't always as life-changing as you might want them to be. Uh, We all think, man, if I just had a million dollars, that would change things. Well, maybe it would, but maybe that wouldn't be enough for financial independence. Maybe that would not be the thing that allows you 
to live lifestyles of the rich and famous. So if you do have money come into your possession, whether it be through an inheritance or through gifting or through some sort of windfall, recognize that while right now it feels like a lot of money, time has the ability to either erode that or grow it exponentially. And you get to choose which one of those two paths that money goes. All right. We talked about what the, you know, the very small portion of wealthy people get it from inheriting it. So let's kind of transition to the next thing. And this one, this one's pretty scarce. Mm -hmm. It's the virtuoso. These are people so talented, meaning that the salt shaker of talents, if you haven't heard, let me give you my quick explanation on this. When we're created, I think that, um, you know, up in heaven, God's sitting there with the salt shaker of talents, and he gets distracted. Somebody's talking to him, and he'll realize, oh, my goodness, I gave Justin Timberlake. Not only <laughs> is this guy going to be good looking, this guy is going to be able to dance. He's going to be able to sing. And he's a that, scratch golfer. That's a, and he's a great athlete because he used to do great in the, the celebrity basketball tournaments, too. So, you know, there's obviously something going on where that salt shaker of talents just got a little extra pizzazz. Bo, I'll give Bo a compliment. Oh, I, I mean, it. nothing is more annoying than a guy who's strong, smart, athletic, <laughs> just got a lot of stuff. So, but but here's the reality: this isn't that many people. Mm-hmm. From our own research, it's only seven percent of our clients reached success by just being a, a, a person that was so gifted, so talented. This is also your LeBron James, sure. your, 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 your Michael Jordans. It's all your great gifted athletes because there's just something there that is so scarce of a resource that people just show up with checkbooks to, to because they want to capture and, it. And I think what's so hard is, is being super talented is one thing. Figuring out how to, I'm going to use the word monetize. That makes it sound sleazy. But what I mean is figuring out how to maximize your potential is a whole other thing. I mean, I can think about folks who I went to school with that had all the talent in the world that were such amazing athletes that they literally could have played almost any professional sport that they wanted to but they just did not seize the opportunity. They did not take advantage of the talents they were given. So if you are someone who falls into this category, we think there are a few ways that you can maximize, a few things that you can do that will help set you up on the right path. Well, yeah, this is one. I, I will tell you, it's it's a blessing and a curse to be um, gifted with the salt shaker of talents and the fact that there is potential that you'll have big windfalls come your way, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that you necessarily will be responsible to turn that into wealth, the wealth that's keepable wealth, Mm -hmm. that's a consistent wealth. So this is something we talk about for for those of you who are trying to figure out how you nurture and grow this. I think you ought to sit down and figure out what your talents are. Mm -hmm. What is something you do better than 95% of the public? Or if you have children or grandchildren, pay attention to these things as well, because it's those gifts that you do want to nurture, but then you want to nurture it with a balance of good behavior to make sure it does have some stickiness like Bo described. And recognize that nurturing it, even, even when you are talented, even when you are skilled, nurturing it takes time. So make sure you hone that. With 10,000 hours of experience, I mean, you can hear the stories about Michael Jordan and how much he would practice or Kobe Bryant and how much time he would put in. I mean, these people, even though they were born with so much talent, they were actually willing to do the hard work of honing that. So don't be someone who just rests on your laurels. If, if learning comes easy to you, continue to advance your learning. If the vocation that you're in is easy for you, figure out how to become not just the top 10%, but the top 5% at what you're doing. So that way you're constantly honing, constantly improving what you're able to do with the talent you've been given. Yeah. As, as we like to say internally, don't skip leg day. Don't skip you know, leg do the day. hard work, do the stuff that other people won't do, and that will create success for you. Here's something I think is interesting is be realistic. If you're one of these people that's blessed with you come into windfalls from your talents, actually turn some of it into to assets mm-hmm. that become wealth building assets you know one of the things I, i've mentioned previously dave grohl had a weird relationship with his father but when he, he actually started hitting it big and started getting the checks his um square of a father told him son just treat that money that's coming in like it's not coming in mm-hmm. for long and you know and treat it like that you've got to make this last for years after you've left this game of music uh, and, and he took that. He started, and there's a reason that Dave Grohl, last time we checked, was worth over $400 million, mm-hmm. is because he started putting his money to work. I used to work with professional athletes when I was at a previous firm, and it made me so sad, and I try to share, their careers would typically last less than three years, mm-hmm. but yet they're getting a lifetime of earnings 
packed into about 18 to 36 months, if they would go in with the understanding that that money's not going to keep coming every year, it's actually a very short window of, of that big peak earnings, I think they would have treated it differently. So be realistic with the limited window you have and actually put that money to work. Okay, Brian. So we've talked about folks that are born into it, which maybe you can't control a ton. We've talked uh, about another one, which are the virtuosos who were born talented. Maybe you can't really control that a whole lot as well. This third one you can control. However, it's still, in our world, a very small segment of the population. Not everyone can succeed at this while everyone may have the opportunity for it. And we've just dubbed this the risk taker. Oh, yeah. This is this is the buck wild way. This is where, this is where you're like, whew, I'm going to be a cowboy. I'm going to figure out a way to take my risk tolerance and will myself into success by just doing crazy stuff. And, and we put... Examples, this is your entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. This is the people that are very comfortable with levered debt, mm -hmm. you know, who, who go out there and make big, big moves yeah. into it. Um, this is the explorer. You know, it's not uncommon that we talk about, you know, when we all look and, and when you have people who pick on the billionaires, mm -hmm. how did people get to be billionaires? Mm -hmm. Billionaires are the explorers. These are the people that go discover something, they create something that we all didn't know we needed. This is your Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. This is your 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 Bezos, your your Disney, your Musk. These people actually created wealth by creating something we didn't even know we needed, but none of this is what I call easy. As Bo has already shared, 10%, mm -hmm. this is a small, small sliver of the people who are wealthy. And I think what's interesting about these risk takers is they see the world differently. They view it differently than the rest of the population. I think uh, it was Steve Jobs who had this quote, everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. I think he really had this idea of, I can do anything. I can build anything. I can accomplish anything. Because I look around at all the things that have happened and recognize I can be this. I can be just as much a part of that as anyone else. And so can you. And then, of course, Brian, this one is one of your favorites. Walt Disney said, hey, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. Uh, these risk takers, these folks who are willing to go out on a limb, are willing to do what other people are not willing to do and what can happen is they can have outcomes that may not quite be available to other folks because they're willing to do those things. Well, I, I want to tell, I want to give the cautionary tell is that we always love to talk about the risk takers because they have the the Phoenix type stories mm -hmm. where they just this this rocket ride to success. But you know that there's some survival bias in this. So sure. There is a much more gory path of carnage of the people who tried to go this path of risk and it actually failed on them. So we want to create some tips and tricks for the money got take for maximization if you are going to go this buck wild path. And here's what we came up with is that definitely if you're going to do anything like an entrepreneur type activity or take risk, you want to measure twice, cut once endeavor and, and make sure that you're not just st stepping out on passion and excitement, that you actually have a plan and a system for success. Yeah, I think when you look at the success of small businesses, it's something like the vast majority fail within the first year. And then and even and then the number that make it to five years is an even smaller percentage of small businesses. And often it is because it's lack of preparation. It's mm -hmm. people not recognizing that there's work that has to go into the business before you actually hang the shingle and go out and launch yourself because it's hard. There is risk involved. There are going to be unknown unknowns. Well, I think so often, and especially in the world in which we live today, social media and TikTok and Instagram has made us all think, oh, no. You need to go seize the day, carpe diem, go be the best version of yourself. And while, yes, we want you to do those things, it's not something you wake up today and decide you're going to do. It's something that you woke up a year ago and began putting place, putting actions into motion to be able to work towards that goal. Even if you have the talent, you have the passion, you even have the good business structure or setup, you still likely going to need three years mm -hmm. of liquidity Absolutely. and money to get you through that. Don't just assume that you're so good and so passionate um, that it, that it's going to work. You need to actually have a plan and you need to have liquidity because I think a lot of people reach failure from just that lack of the the step. If they would have just maybe worked in their boring job for a year or two, built up that extra cash, the bridge to success. 
I think you would just see that instead of the, the scary stat of how many businesses fell or how many risky endeavors, you'd have a much higher percentage of success. I, I love what you said, Brian. You said you need to have a plan in place. And when we think about like entrepreneurial endeavors or even risk-taking endeavors, not even starting a business, but if you're thinking about a real estate investment or you're thinking about creating something, you're thinking about an idea that you need to have a plan in place, but it does not need to be a singular solo focus plan, you need to have a three-dimensional plan, a plan that you're able to look at through what we call the 3D glasses. Yeah, make sure you put on your 3D glasses, just like if you're going to start a business. I know I went through this exercise um, when we'd done commercial real estate, which was levered debt. We did this exercise because here's what it means when we say do a 3D um, plan by putting on your 3D glasses is that I want you first, let's go ahead and daydream. Go ahead and put the, 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 the dream of Oh my goodness, we are going to be rich mm -hmm. because that's good. That's fun. That's energizing. That's motivating to have a plan with all the things lining up and you getting green lights and, and having success. But then I want you to also do step two, which is a down to earth plan. This is what you think will happen. Highest probability outcome. This is what you, not necessarily, you're still probably going to be rich down the road, but this is going to take a while. There's going to be some obstacles, but this is the down to earth plan. And then, of course, do not. Not skip the third one of the 3D glasses, the doo doo plan. This is when, <laughs> oh my goodness, how was I such a knucklehead that I did this? It's gone. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. It's better if you approach this on the planning side than the reality side because it could be catastrophic if you're ad adjusting to this plan for the first time as you approach it in life. It's much better if you create a plan that addresses all three of these situations. And a little bit of planning can be so valuable because risky investments become reasonable when your pockets are deep enough to weather any storm that runs your way, that blows your way. It's, it's not uncommon. It's why we see, I'm going to use this as an example, and it's a bit of a trending example presently, but if the average everyday Joe decided they wanted to go buy a social media platform, they might not be able to weather that. That might be too risky or too dangerous of an endeavor. However, if a billionaire who already has deep pockets says, hey, I want to go take this risk, I want to go pursue this opportunity, they likely will be able to weather that storm because they're deep enough. To thine own self be true and recognize when you go out and take this risk, are you getting too far out ahead of your skis or is it a calculated risk that is okay for you to take in your current financial situation so that it won't derail all the other pieces of your financial life? Well, I think when we got into commercial real estate, a very wise individual that we know, he was a former landlord of ours, when we were talking to him about to get some guidance, he said, boys, I, I hope you got enough money to weather the storms that come your way. Because that's what anybody who knows anything about like levered debt and real estate is it that you can have volatility in periods where you drag in that U-shaped mm -hmm. recovery for years. And you just need to make sure you have enough resources to cover yep. that darkness. It's the same thing with the business. I told you, when I started my first company, I built up cash reserve to carry me, a plan to carry me for three years because I knew it was going to take a while to replace the income I'd left behind. Do not skip the step of making sure that you have the liquidity that you've actually built deep enough pockets to give you the opportunity to actually succeed. Because if you go into this, you don't have those resources, you might be disappointed because just like oxygen is so important mm -hmm. for us to breathe, your liquidity, your cash is going to be very important to your success of whatever crazy buck wild endeavor you're going after. I laugh every time you say Buckwild. I know. That's right. Buckwild works almost <laughs> as good as Naked. I mean, there's almost, a reason people there, love yeah. hearing that stuff. All right. So we've talked about we've talked about three of the ways that people get wealthy. Let's talk about the fourth one, which is the second largest, right? Yep. Now, this one, again, this is a lot of the folks that we interact with, but still, when you look at it, it's not a majority. 17% of the folks with whom we interact say this is the way that they were able to build their wealth they were able to turn themselves into what we're just calling a business executive. They were able to work their way up the corporate ladder. They started at a job and worked their way up until they were in a management role, in a leadership role, in an ownership role, in some sort of capacity. And with that, the benefits of serving in those roles came along with it, namely a really big shovel. Yeah, I mean, you, when you have a, such a big income, 
It gives you a lot of opportunity because you've heard, guys, I've talked about the three ingredients of success, which is that discipline, Mm -hmm. that discipline where you live on less than you make creates the margin that leads to money that gets invested in the, of course, have enough time that you're Mm -hmm. successful to let it grow through compounding. Um, But here's the interesting thing. Uh, A business executive is not too different than a virtuoso in the fact that they have big chunks of money yep. coming their way. So maybe you didn't have to be as disciplined to have this much income coming in. Um, but it is one of those things where you still need to be very self-aware to make sure that you make the most out of this opportunity. Yeah, far too often we see on the negative side, executives have this big incomes. It allows them to cover not having discipline, or it allows them to even in some circumstances discover not starting early, right? Not taking advantage of time and putting Mm -hmm. it on their side. So if you're someone who does fall into this camp, or maybe it looks like this is going to be your trajectory, you're going to work your way up the corporate ladder, we want to give you some tips and tricks to think about in order to maximize this, to make sure that you do fall into that. And the first one is maximize those executive benefits. Well, leadership becomes unique things that may be available to you, like employee stock purchase plans, RSUs, stock options, other types of incentives. Those things are exciting exciting for a reason, and they can have a huge impact in your financial life if you recognize the value of them and the value they can have inside of your financial plan. Yeah, you definitely need to be familiar with these benefits. You need to take advantage of these benefits. But I do want to caution you to make sure you understand the difference between human capital and then your investment mm-hmm. capital. Because um, knowing how all the incentives and everything work, you do want to take advantage because capital gains – um, as well as the employee stock purchase plans with those huge discounts. Yep. This is no different. For a lot of you, this is no different than free money like a company mm-hmm. match from your employer. So take advantage of it. But also have a path or a plan or a system that will turn that into capital outside mm-hmm. of the company you work with. Because what you don't want to end up with, we've seen it so, you know, so much volatility going on right now. And I think people are realizing. If you're concentrated, meaning all your human capital, your wages, your talents are coming, are poured into this company, and you're an executive for them, but then you never created diversified capital and income outside of the company, if something ever happens to the company, you're kaput. Your wealth, your success was tied too much to it. Let's build some wealth and success outside of this. This is something... I mean, you've seen this firsthand, yeah. right? Like you, You've actually lived with people... Who experienced this, right? Like you saw this at your previous firm where people failed to do this and it blew up on them completely. I, I, I thought it was very interesting because I'm, I'm now old enough. I, I asked people, hey, do you remember Lucent Technologies? Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, if you started the investment game in the last 10 years, you, you're like, who? And I, and I always, it cracks me up because Lucent was one of those top 10 companies that mm-hmm. everybody, it's not too far from like with the world comms and these other boom bust type stories, the Enrons and other things. But I knew too many executives because it was an Atlanta based company that were so excited about what Lucent Technologies was creating that they never created that separation Mm -hmm. from their human capital to their investment capital so that when it did go bad in the, you know, because that happens from time to time, they were stuck. Mm -hmm. And that's something that still is a regret for a lot of these people. And look, as a financial advisor, When you're talking to executives, quite a few executives, you'll try to tell people, hey, get your money diversified. But they're like, yeah, but you don't know what we got coming. We Mm -hmm. got some great stuff. We're going to make a fortune. The greed overcomes the fear that they should have that they're taking too much risk. And then you're left with devastation at the end. All right. So we've talked about small percentages, right? We had like 9% of folks who inherit their wealth and 7% that are virtuosos. And then we just talked about the executives that was 17%. But you might have noticed none, none of these are like big percentages. None, no, Like, okay, so guys, who are these wealthy people? Like, who are the folks? You're talking about how rich people get wil- rich, how wealthy people build wealth. It seems that there's a huge gap. There's something missing. There's something you've not said, some strata of folks that we've not uncovered. And you'd be right, because the fifth one, I think is the one that's the most exciting. And this one is the one that we just call the saver and the investor. Yeah, this one, this one's exciting to me because it, it's it's I tell people all the time, becoming wealthy is so simple. Mm-hmm. Now, don't mishear me. I did not say it's easy. I mean, because we've seen 
Most people are not willing to practice the discipline to actually live on less than they make, make the good decisions. But it does make me excited when our own research shows 67% of the millionaires we work with, their big break, their port where they, they pierced into becoming wealthy, crossing into seven figures, was because of their behaviors of being a saver and an investor. That mm-hmm. is that ought to be excitement. That ought to be kindling to set the fire on your life to start doing this for yourself as well. What I think is wild is, is when you think back to the book that Dr. Stanley, Dr. Danko wrote, The Millionaire Next Door, they uncovered this same thing. They recognized, hey, when we talk to like the real millionaires out there, it's not the folks that are living in the hills. It's the folks that are living next door. What's really great is they uncovered some common traits or factors among these people. And we've seen this play out in our own study. We see this with our clients. They live below their means. They recognize how to allocate their time, their energy, and their money efficiently. They're not wasteful. They recognize that financial independence and saving for a great big beautiful tomorrow is more important than social status today and looking like I'm wealthy. Their parents did not reach down and provide economic outpatient care to them, nor are they providing economic outpatient care to their kids. They're teaching their kids how to make wise financial decisions. They recognize market opportunities and take advantage of them. And in a lot of cases, they chose the right occupation. They recognized, hey, if I'm going to be working for a living, I might as well do something that I love and I'm passionate about that is marketable, that I can build wealth doing. Those are common threads that were spread throughout there. And what the fees folks did is they took those things and they saved and invested over the course of a lifetime. Um, I I feel very fortunate. Look, I'm sad because she's now left the house, but I I think it's, there's a great learning opportunity having a daughter who's in college Mm -hmm. and we have conversations and I can just see the light bulbs going off in her head. And, and, and I had the same realization. This is going to sound a little bit you'll, off, but you'll understand what I'm saying, is that she'll tell me about somebody who's struggling with something or, or something's going on, and I'll say, do you see where the problem lies? And, and it's really that incremental decision-making that people will make, and she'll have somebody who will have done something else. Said, do you, I'm just going to go ahead and just – spoil the plot for you or the rest of the story. And I wish somebody had told me this from an earlier time, because I think as as you transition from kid to an adult, it takes a while for you to realize most adults are bad at being adults. (laughs) They're bad with money. It's true. They're bad with their life decisions. They don't do the right things. And this is something that, and look, there's stats behind this. I saw this was interesting. 90% of the public is just straight up bad with money. Mm -hmm. Um, Look at this. 60% of Americans make less than 60 grand. By the way, Another stat that's not on this tweet that I'm reading off of is 60% of Americans can't come up with can't a thousand, come up with a thousand bucks. bucks. So, I mean, yep. there's a case, I, I could rest the case on that. 82% of Americans make uh, less than a hundred grand. Mm-hmm. 92% of Americans make less than 150 grand. Twitter's not real. The big thing I want to focus on is, and I'm not saying you have to have, because the actual the research shows you don't have to have a big income mm-hmm. to create wealth. Nope. That's what saving and investing, I think it just shows you that a lot of what you put out there on social media is completely flexing its faults. Mm -hmm. It's trying to drive you towards consumption versus being a builder of wealth. And that's the point I was trying to to, to teach my daughter when we had a discussion is don't let somebody try to plant the seeds of you need to have that nice car. You need to have the nice clothes. No, you need to focus on how do you challenge yourself? How do you choose the right major in college? How do you set yourself all those seven traits that the millionaire next door shared is is exact type of things that can take two two boys who who don't didn't have a ton of money started at zero from South Atlanta to where we now do mm-hmm. have success and get to share that. I think this is an inspirational story, and anyone can do it. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what your background is. I don't even care what your income mm-hmm. is. If you start early and off enough, you can be a success. Uh, that's that's what I love about this fifth category of wealth builders is that it is literally available to anyone. It's available to anyone, no matter how young you are, how old you are, how smart you are, how dumb you are, how talented you are, how untalented you are. If you can exercise these behaviors, you have the ability to control your future. You have the ability to set yourself up for success. So there are some tips and tricks that we want to share with you 
to maybe make it a little bit easier. The first one, Brian, and I love this because you talked about this in show prep and you went long on this. You said you got to enter through these, what you called get wealthy behaviors. What do you, what do you mean by what are, what are get wealthy behaviors? Well, it's living on the less you make, mm-hmm. hence discipline, turning that discipline into margin that gets invested your army of dollar bills. That's the money. And then taking that money and actually giving it enough time to grow. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that is what creates success. Those are get wealthy behaviors is just letting your money do the hard work. And, and I think that what's so great is your money doing the hard work is the exciting part about it. If you can start saving Early, I'm, let me change my language here. If you can start investing as early as possible, oh, well, uh, Bo, I'm 35 years old. Okay, start investing. Oh, but Bo, I'm 46 years old. Okay, start investing. The earlier you start, the more powerful your dollars can be. Even if you didn't start 20 years ago, that's okay. The absolute best time to start investing was yesterday, which means the second best time is today. If you don't believe us, I want you to go to moneyguy.com slash resources Check out this wealth multiplier. Take this, put it up on your bathroom mirror, put it up on your refrigerator, maybe fold it up, put it on top of your credit card, slid in your wallet so that every time you pull out that credit card, you say, oh man, do I really want to spend this money? Because I know as a 25-year-old, every dollar that I invest could turn into $44 for me in the future. The sooner you can recognize this get wealthy behavior, the sooner you can make your money start working even harder than you do. Well, and it doesn't take a lot. I I shared with you guys, my big inspirational point was when I had an economics teacher tell me if I could just save $100 a month, Mm -hmm. I'd be a millionaire. And it just lit me a fire of, holy cow, something that I thought was just impossible is now sitting right in front of me. It created kind of an inevitable wealth situation. And this is, I shared earlier, and I feel a little guilty about it because I picked on how bad the public is, but that, that, how bad the typical person is with money is an actual opportunity Mm -hmm. for you to just essentially Teflon coach yourself to not fall into the traps that everyone else is and actually just take a little bit of today. I'm talking about an incremental small decision. I don't care if it starts off at $50 a month. Just do something. If you can make one small incremental decision today, you really will be setting up that great, big, beautiful tomorrow. And then as you're doing this, like you figure that out, as you start making these incremental decisions... Make sure you have a plan in place for how you're going to do that. We think that a great way to do that is to maximize and optimize the financial order of operations. Nine steps, tried and true, to walk you through what you should do with your dollars so it's not a guessing game. Oh, I just got a raise at work. What should I do? Okay, are your deductibles covered? Are you getting your employer match? Have you paid off your high interest debt? You can literally work through these nine steps so that you don't have to guess anymore. So you can focus on the things that you want to focus on. If you can do this steadily over a lifetime, over a career, over a working period, you're going to be amazed at what it turns into. Brian, you say this all the time. I'm going to steal one of your quotes, and I'm sorry for stealing it. We so often fall into the world of thinking linearly. Yeah, I'm here today. I want to be here tomorrow linearly. So often in our lives, when we can put systems like this in place, the growth is exponential. And I know that you and I have both ended up in a place today we never thought we'd be in. We no. never, ever thought we'd be in. And it's, but it's because of those small little behaviors we both started doing, some of us longer ago than others, and just kept doing through time. Well, I would encourage you, make it inevitable. I mean, because that's that's the thing. Because human nature, we we we... We overcomplicate things. And if I can encourage you, make your path to wealth and success as easy as possible. You know how you do that? Make it automatic. Yep. Just go ahead and set up you know, monthly investments. If you're wondering, hey, what type of investments? There's a reason we talk about index funds. There's a reason we talk about index target retirement funds, because all you have to think about is, how much can I save? When do I need it? It'll do all the heavy lifting. It's so easy these days. Go check out some of the biggest, do your due diligence and research at some of the biggest providers, the Vanguards, the Fidelity Investments, the Charles Schwab's. It is so easy to build wealth these days. Please start making those small incremental decisions. Now, Bo, I think it's important. to. We also need to kind of close this thing out by sharing what wealth isn't. Because we started off talking about Wealth is not primarily from inheriting wealth. No. Wealth is not only just about little bits of talent and other things that maybe the, the salt shaker of talents were, were, were dumped on you. Most wealth is about you doing those get wealthy type mm-hmm. behaviors, the small incremental decisions that people can do 
But I want to know, I want people to recognize, it's not from what you see so much on social media with play stupid games, with stupid prizes. Yep. There is a whole section out there of people trying to distract you and take you away from the inevitable wealth journey of those good behaviors. What are we talking about when we say that? Yeah, it's don't don't get sold something that's not going to move you towards your goal. Maybe that's some complicated insurance based product. Maybe that's some like day trading strategy so you can go out there and beat the market. Maybe it's oh, you know what? Let's go let, let's go refinance your house and we're going to take the proceeds and we're going to do a cash out. We're going to go invest that. We're going to be highly levered. Building wealth is not get rich quick. Becoming wealthy is not get rich quick. The beautiful thing about wealth building is it's behavioral. If you can put the right behaviors in place, nobody can stop you but you. All you have to do is make sure you tune out the distractions, don't get lost in the noise, and focus on the goals you know you want to work towards. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And you too can fall into that 67% of folks that are able to build their wealth simply by saving and investing and implementing sound behaviors through time. Here's a here's a great way to think about this as you close it out. I'm hoping that inner voice that, you know, when you're showering and putting the shampoo in and you're talking to yourself, you know, but just nobody can hear it because you're not saying it out loud. That's your inner voice. Mm-hmm. I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping that inner voice is an optimist yep. because you're hopefully getting excited about this inevitable wealth journey. But it is one of those things. All right, here's a question for you to ask that inner voice and start training that inner voice to ask you every morning when you wake up, what incremental decision, what small decision are you doing today to build, to take you closer to that great big beautiful tomorrow and to build abundance in your life? Because it doesn't take much. I'm telling you if, you, if you just want to start saving and investing $50 a month, $200 a month, mm-hmm. funding your Roth IRA, making sure you have emergency reserves, Going and checking out the financial order of operations at moneyguy.com slash resources, subscribing so that you're actually getting updates and knowing what we're going on. You're going to wake up five, six, seven years in the future. You go, whoa, how does this, this happen? Is, this is working. I, I, I come from nothing. My family seems to be caught in this, 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 this complete trap that nobody in my family can create success. And then you're going to say, just from these simple behaviors, these small incremental decisions, my life is completely changed. My children's life is going to be changed. Mm-hmm. My grandchildren's life is going to be changed. You can do it. Make something happen today. Please go check out all of our free stuff, moneyguy.com slash resources. We're trying to load you up so you can learn, apply, grow to the point that you create so much success that you're going to say, man, you guys told me my life is going to start off as simple, but it's going to naturally through success create complication. You're going to need a co-pilot. That's when the abundance cycle will reach its maturity. You'll take the relationship to the next level, and we work with clients all across the country. I love what we get to do. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. Money Guy Team, out.